I think we got the board. We got, uh, I guess we got, give Richard one more minute. Little Pat's Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> That was smart. I, Should I just mute? Uh, sure. Does everyone mute? Yeah. Any reason we're not expecting Richard Meredith? Um, no, but let's go ahead. He, I, okay. I think he can jump in when he gets gets on. Yep. Do you have the flag again? Or, I do. <laughs> there we go. All right, start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I don't know if we stand up or sit down for this Pledge of Allegiance, but I guess we'll just <coughs> stand up. All who wish join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag. of the United, the United States, States of America. Of America. And to the republic, to the republic for which it stands, which it stands one, nation, one nation, one nation, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. For all. So this is a special meeting, so the agenda is a little tightened up. Um, I don't think Meredith or I have any agenda adjustments. Does anybody else have an agenda request? Okay. Seeing none. I don't, I don't have any agenda requests, but I see that um, no, Shauna talk. put something in the chat, uh, wants to know if handouts are going to be posted online the way we did. And now I see that Meredith answered that. So I think, I think we're all set on that. Yep. Uh, Rachel's already put the link in. So they're, they're at the same location. Yep. Any other public? The comment takes a second to unmute. Okay, seeing no public comment, we'll jump acknowledgements. Um, you want to start, Aaron? Um, uh, I just want to acknowledge everybody's hard work again. It's, it hasn't gotten any easier, and maybe it's gotten harder, and everybody's still doing a great job. Jake? Yeah, I'll acknowledge uh, school vacation week and the well-deserved break that uh, staff, uh, parents, and students all deserve. So, you know, just everyone take this time to recharge and get ready for the last push. Yep, I don't have anything to add, but I would certainly second everything that's been said. Everybody's doing an amazing job, so I appreciate that. Mark? Uh, I've got nothing at this time. Thank you. Leo? Um, I guess I'll acknowledge uh, the town council for seating me in this uh, temporary position. And and I do want to acknowledge all staff, I've been on here, but all staff and, and students for what they've uh, been able to do uh, in this sh in this crazy time. Uh, it's been impressive. So I did want to publicly acknowledge that. Great. And I don't see any other student reps. So um, discussion items. First up uh, is, I was going to acknowledge one oh, sorry, Meredith. Yeah. Uh, just want to acknowledge our food service staff. They um, normally don't work during uh, April vacation. Uh, they're school year employees, which means they don't um, work over school holidays, but they are there this week uh, providing meals. So I want to acknowledge um, them for their dedication. Thank you. And now we switch to the budget discussion. So just to contextualize this, um, you know, traditionally this is the time when we have to wrap up the budget. We would uh, be taking a vote now and probably having a special meeting early next week to sign the warrants and then heading off into the calendar of required 10-day uh, notices and five-day notices towards uh, an annual budget meeting and um, eventually the referendum. But uh, at this point, the referendum has been officially postponed, I think at least until July. So we effectively have another month to work on the budget, which is something usually the town takes this month. Usually the schools are, because of our calendar, our requirements of notice are not able to take this. So uh, whereas normally this would be the final, final vote, um, 
really, I think we have another month. So this is probably more in the context of a conversation um, in the, that we can, uh, well, things are changing so quickly. I think it would be unwise to seal things off at this point in time, but uh, did want to just briefly have another conversation for exact same reason, because things are changing so quickly. So Meredith, I know you sent some documents out. Uh, um, you want to introduce? Sure. Uh, so um, one, and well, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, we, we should revisit the, you know, kind of what the level we've been talking about, about items to include or not include in the budget. But the other conversation we haven't had is um, carry forward. And I think that probably is an especially important conversation in the context of COVID. So maybe we can start with the um, line items that uh, are in the documents you brought, and then we can talk about the carry forward. Well, I kind of wanted to back up, and I'm sorry, I didn't hear everything you said when you entered this because I was trying to multitask and um, got that link posted again. So uh, the the documents, for those of you who are looking for them, uh, they're just on the website under the board meeting page where there's the list of board meetings, the links there. But if you go to the board meeting um, page on the website, it has a list of dates where agenda is posted in minutes and on that um, calendar of dates for today, you can see board meeting materials. Um, so the other thing I, I just want to add, and I'm not sure that, um, Brian, if you mentioned this, but, um, you know, I was in a, I was in a meeting last week um, with the Penquist superintendent region and the commissioner of education joined us for that meeting. And one thing that she said was um, they are expecting major revenue losses at the state level. Her word was dramatic, um, is what they're anticipating. And so it was just a um, kind of a cautionary um, advice from, from the commissioner to say, um, your ED 279s are not being adjusted, but nothing is guaranteed. And so they're, you know, listening to some of the more, um, uh, the superintendents who have more longevity in the position in our group after the commissioner got off the call, you know, they've seen uh, times when there've been economic downturns where there, where there are um, curtailments of subsidy. Um, and um, I think it would be wise of us to plan for that um, potential um, curtailment during the coming year. Um, and so that's one of the things that, you know, that I felt like in talking with Brian and Lynn that we wanted to kind of um, bring up with the board because we haven't um, really received a signal from the Department of Education really until we heard that from the meeting last week. And, um, and then just the more you hear in the news, you know that um, the state economy, as well as the national economy, but our state's economy is going to be impacted by this. So um, along with that, we um, really, the, the impetus for this meeting this week was um, I felt like our negotiations team needed um, kind of to, to have a meeting with the board at large this week before we move forward with negotiations next week in light of um, this information about the budget downturn next year and to just examine our board goals. So that's um, really why we're having the meeting now. Um, so we're gonna look at the broader context to begin with and then as we move through the meeting toward the end, we'll go into executive session uh, to discuss our negotiations um, plan. So. That was my intro. Yep, that was good. That was um, all things that I missed. So I thought we could just briefly revisit, um, you know, at the kind of not it's not the line item, but at the level of program uh, things that uh, document you sent out on meeting budget details to recap for everybody, but Leo in particular, we've done. And then after that, we could switch to a conversation about carry forward and reserves and planning. Right. Yeah, so when Can we start the quick budget, question, go ahead. Quick, uh, Meredith, do you think that curtailment uh, could have, could also pertain to the end of this year, or do you think they were, was she just talk, talking about next year? Uh, didn't really say. Um, 
You didn't say specifically. Um, I, I think I, I got the impression that it was a look forward kind of concern, but um, no one really probed on that, that issue. I think um, okay. from the discussion among our group, I think the people, as I said, who've been doing this for a while um, have advised the group that they're more concerned about next year's subsidy. But as she said, nothing is guaranteed. So Meredith, just okay. to clarify, I'm sorry, just to clarify, you said the, that she said the ED-279 is not changing, but they cannot guarantee it. Is that right? All right. I think in other years where this has happened, they don't necessarily go back and adjust the ED-279. They just give people notice. Um, like I think um, they were referring back to around the probably 0708 school year um, where districts didn't receive their last subsidy check. There wasn't an adjustment, a formal adjustment in the ED-279, but that's how the a shortfall was addressed with schools anyway. In other words, everybody just got an 8.3% cut in subsidy, one twelfth subsidy. I mean, the other wild card in this is um, in the last recession, 2009 and 10, the federal government, one of the stimulus priorities was state governments because the federal government can deficit spend, but most state governments can't. And a lot of that was targeted. Yep, looks like Brian's freezing. In Maine at the time, but uh, I, I know in Arizona. So, am I back? Brian, I think you're, Brian, I think you're gonna have to probably end your video or maybe move somewhere better because you keep cutting out at least on my end and it sounds on Meredith's end. Too. Okay, I'll try cutting video and see if that helps. Um, just pointing out that traditionally, the at the last recession, the federal government did um, part of their stimulus package was holding state budgets for K-12 mostly. Uh, I don't know if it was completely harmless, but close to harmless. And that hasn't, uh, that's barely been talked about so far. So that's another big wild card out there, whether that happens or not. Well, I actually had a question on that, Meredith. Maybe this came up at your meeting. Is is there has been um, already two slugs of money uh, coming from the federal government given to the states? One of them is specifically was specifically aided for education, right? And that's been divvied that's been divvied out um, at the higher ed level. Um, but it sounds like there hasn't been decisions made at the pre K through twelve level. So I wondered if you heard me about that, and then. There's also some money that is, has been given to the state where it sounds like to me there's a dispute between the governor and the legislature over who gets to spend that. But the governor's position, is, from what she stated, was that that money was going, she was going to decide how that money was distributed through departments. Um, and, and if that would at least potentially open up some more money for out of that fund for education and then so I wondered if you heard anything on that. And then there is, there is sounds to me like there's gonna be another piece of federal legislation which specifically looks at state and local um, budgets. Um, certainly the, the House Democrats are in support and, and the Trump administration has signaled its support. The Senate Republicans are a little more reluctant, but um, I think there's, a, there's so much up in the air, but I'm wondering if you, did you hear anything about the money that's already been allocated? Sorry. Muted, Mary. Uh, I forgot that. Um, that's part of what we were going to talk about tonight. Um, but um, one of those we know more about than others. And I see Allison Woodard's on the call. Allison's been attending some webinars for us around the CARES Act. And that's one bucket of money that's coming down from the federal government. It reminds me of the ARA funds. When those funds came out, they are um, really flowing through uh, existing federal programs. So our title money, our IDEA money, McKinney-Vento, those kind of federal programs. Um, and so we'll get an allocation that's based upon our Title I subsidy. Um, it's not really directly tied to Title I, it's just how they're calculating it. So we'll get 80% of our Title I subsidy for this school year, which comes out to around $93,000. And so that's part of what we're gonna share tonight on some initial thoughts on that money. 
There's nothing official that's come out about that, just some an initial information because the state hasn't even gotten their application from the federal government yet. Uh, so they just, you know, are sending out information to us based on what they know to date on that. So the other money that's coming to the state is through the governor and, and you know, I don't know a lot about the um, potential disagreement at the state level about who has purview over those funds, but in our meeting last week, the commissioner did indicate that some of the governor's um, funding under the state money from the federal government um, would come to education, but in a pretty um, probably specific way around access to um, help with um, you know statewide access to virtual education for you know, in case we have to continue with this, with devices, with platforms for instruction, with um, Wi-Fi, those kinds of um, purchases. So specifically mentioned they're looking at a um, kind of an instructional um, uh, LMS platform for the state um, with instructional modules. So looks like that's where they're thinking about spending the um, education portion of of that money at least that's all we heard about specifically i think there's a lot that's unknown right now one thing they said about the cares money is that it's going to be pretty flexible um, but it still has to fall under one of the existing federal programs um, so you can't say well you know we lost $93,000 in revenue, so we're just gonna plug in that revenue into our existing budget. That's not how it works. So we'll have to write goals, that kind of thing. So um, kind of going back to um, kind of setting the stage for how, how we got to this point. So our initial budget that we put out, um, the board asked us to go back and take a look to see if we could make some reductions there and um, our um, work on that is summarized in the, the budget document that's called budget details, supporting budget documents, what I named it on the, um, on the board webpage. But when I sent it to you, I think it's called budget details. So it reminds you that we had some tier one um, items that we were considering for reduction and then some tier two. And the list that you have there shows all of the tier one that we ended up moving forward as a budget reduction. So all of those have been removed from the budget. So we've already reduced, you know, close to 400,000 out of the budget from its initial um, development. Um, and then just, you know, we had these other items under tier two that are still in the budget that we wanted to just remind you that those are there as well. We do think that the CARES money holds some potential um, with some of the items in tier two. Um, and I've also had a conversation with Sharon around um, just some concerns we have with compensatory education needs and potential um, costs around special education services that we may need to use some CARES money to help with those um, kinds of needs. And specifically, she and I have been talking about the speech teacher that we moved back to contracted service status and, and trying to see is there a way to make uh, that uh, a fully funded position rather than contracted service under the CARES Act because we think that's an area where we don't feel like we have the capacity to meet any kind of compensatory education needs. Um, whereas we think, you know, even in, under the best of circumstances, contracted service in that realm was going to be challenging next year. And so we think that the CARES Act probably is somewhat is a place where we need to look to augment what we have in our plans for next year around speech. And then I think there's some other things under tier two we might consider as well for CARES. Um, but at, at this point, we, we'd like to wait and see what CARES, what more information we get around the CARES Act um, before we make any final decisions on that. So tonight, really, I think we wanted to just remind everyone of where the work has, uh, where we've come, how, how far we've come so far in our budget process, and, you know, more about the potential uh, road that lies ahead. But as Brian said in his intro, I think that, um, 
you know, we can, we can push our budget process out further. We, we don't need to have on our agenda for next week's meeting, uh, you know, approval of the FY21 budget because our timeline has changed now. So it gives us the opportunity to, um, to wait until more is known to make some decisions around that. Uh, I don't expect that the town knows anything about future revenues at this point either, but I do wonder if there has been, if, if they're getting, if there's any talk on the municipal side about expectations. I mean, we, we obviously can't live in a bubble here. I, I can tell you firsthand what this has done to my business, which is it's cut 75% of my business out in about two weeks. Uh, so the, 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 it's a pretty dramatic impact to, I think, most businesses, obviously. I think we're somewhat in a bubble as a university town and, and you know, for, for the school setting right now, uh, but I, we're not gonna remain in this, this bubble, I don't think. And, and I do wonder if municipal has had any discussions about <clears throat> expectations um, for people paying their, their tax, because that, we've got state funding and we've got local funding. That's all we have, right? Um, so I wonder if there has been any um, municipal discussions on a broader group, if, if there's any, if they're leaning or thinking anything, and if we've, if we've tapped into that to hear what they, what they might be anticipating. I had a conversation uh, with uh, Sophie Wilson last week. Um, we were talking around a couple of specific items, not uh, as much in the round that you're asking, Leo. Um, I mean, I think there's a lot that's unknown in front of both the municipal and the, and the town and the school budget in terms of budget processes and, um, you know, the, the taxation rate and the ability of residents to pay their taxes, certainly. I mean, I, I don't, she didn't indicate that they had had any concrete discussions around that. Um, so I, I think, you know, there's, there's an obvious concern around valuations and how that might change and impact um, tax rates. But um, I haven't and asked I would, if they have any expectations around that. And I, I don't think they do exactly. I'm sure that, I mean, they just, I, I'm just wondering if they've been doing any game planning that way. Cause clearly nobody knows anything um, about how, how it's going to go. But I, I would be, it would be interesting to know if they're, if they're game planning and, and trying to get a sense for that, I think that would be an interesting um, thing to learn. Just again, looking at both of our funding sources, I think is probably pretty, pretty important. I mean, I, I obviously haven't had any conversation with the town, but um, I'm not sure. And your first point about uh, being sensitive to our community and how uh, the economic straits our community is in a, is a completely valid point, but I'm not sure from a practical point of view, for just from a mechanics of, of funding point of view, what's really going to change. I'm not sure that valuations would change that quickly. Um, I know there was supposed to be a big revaluation uh, re process happening this year, but valuations tend to be pretty static. They depend on a lot of home sales to uh, change the valuations. So I don't think they're going to change that quickly. I'm not an expert, but uh, just speaking from my understanding. And um, people not paying, my understanding is that that's, a, you know, and this is one of the things that drives the town crazy, and I do understand it, but um, that's, uh, that's, by law, they're supposed to pass on to us what we uh, have raised and that they're the ones that are the tax collector. So um, I think it's mostly just a sensitivity issue. I'm not sure that there's a practical mechanical issue more to the current economic conditions. I, and I think that that's more what I was getting at. If, if they're, into, again, it's just gonna be anticipation anticipating and modeling you know that's what that's how we're here right all the modeling but um if they're going to be looking what in a typical year say we get a five six percent ten percent i don't know what it is in a typical year where they're chasing and i get that it's ultimately their job to chase but i mean if if municipalities are anticipating that this year instead of ten percent it's going to be 
25 percent that they're going to be chasing i think it's it's that's the mechanics of it i think um so we yeah. i don't think yeah well i can tell you that you know i we didn't have that specific a conversation i'm happy to circle back around to to sophie to ask more about that i mean I think the bottom line is that we need to try to be as sensitive to this as possible in our budget process. And if we can, the further we can push our decision around budget out, um, the more information we will know to help us make a decision that's not an overreaction, but hopefully a, a reaction that's, you know, in line with what we feel like we can do given the circumstances we know at, at that time. I think, you know, that's the, the kind of, fine line we have to walk here um, is that, you know, I also don't want to have a major overreaction to this because I, I don't think that's good for our, you know, the, the service that, that we really are expected to provide in this community. Um, and, you know, if we get out in front of really the, um, what, what ends up coming down the road, I, I don't think that's a, a positive move on our, on our part. So I think we need to, um, start thinking about alternatives and that's was the goal for tonight and um, uh, come together as a group to really um, develop some strategies that we might consider using um, in the event of you know a curtailment that you know if we want to plan for that and how we might want to go about doing that if we want to bring our expenses down further, what are some options and, and, you know, is there some direction the board wants to give on, on that? So that's the, the hope I had for tonight. I mean, so there's really a couple of levers we can pull, right? We can reduce our planned expenses um, and we can try, and, and as Meredith said, that's really kind of, um, that's a little bit throwing a dart at a dartboard right now. It's very hard to predict what, especially what this year's revenues are going to look like. I think we can all predict next year's revenues are going to be down probably unless we come out of this and there's a very quick snapback would be a best case scenario that they're not down next year. But what this year's revenues are going to look like, it's pretty hard to predict. So my, my personal mentality is more kind of um, thinking about reserves and uh, do we have the capacity to handle it if they don't send us the June state subsidy check this year? And I guess your point, Leo, is maybe we should be thinking about what happens if uh, the town. So that that's for me, right? I mean, we can we can cut our expenses and we can cut our proposed tax rates. But um, to me, probably, but, but we're doing that in a complete vacuum right now. So we shouldn't rush to make uh, anything happen. We've got a month, so we should use that month to see what's happening. Uh, we can talk about alternatives, but um, for me, the conversation is probably more about, um, it, it's the cash cushion and the cash reserve to make sure we can handle it if our revenues were to, to drop out drastically. And that's, that's not a conversation we've had yet um, for the budget uh, in general. We had not yet talked about carry forward for the budget. We just had kind of assumed it was the same as last year. Yeah, and related to that, um, on the bottom of the handout um, that we were just looking through the tier one, tier two, the bottom of that, I just wanted to remind the board of our unassigned fund balance. Uh, you can see that at the end of the, uh, or at the beginning of this fiscal year, the unassigned fund balance was 2,112,248. But recall that we put in 816,000 into this budget as carry forward the current budget year. Uh, we also assigned 126,000 to capital reserve. So our, you know, um, net balance there is 1.1. And uh, when Lynn um, is able to give us that uh, projection on the end of year, net change in fund balance, we'll have a better picture of how much the fund balance is going to be impacted by that 816 this year. I anticipate that it will be impacted. Um, we, you know, do have uh, contingencies, but 
we had quite a few unanticipated or, or expenses that came up after the budget was set that we um, were using, um, you know, contingencies to be able to pay for. Um, I mean, it's a little bit unknown because of the time we're in now. Um, it, you know, we, we don't have enough. Um, I guess we'll know uh, really soon when, when Lynn does um, some analysis about the impact of remote learning and um, on our potential projections. But if everything was going as normal, I had anticipated we would definitely impact the fund balance this year. Um, so we don't, we'll know more about that likely by next meeting. Um, we have, as Brian said, just carried forward um, the, the 816-902 in our um, budget revenue picture. Um, so making an assumption that we would stay with that same number in next year's budget. So, you know, we had talked through some options. Brian mentioned reserve. The state came out with a lot of um, uh, new flexibilities around reserve accounts uh, that boards could do to kind of be prepared in the event of a maybe sudden drop in subsidy. Um, whereas before they were a little more rigid in, in their, uh, the way they could be set up. So that's one option for us to consider if we wanted to do that um, for next year. Another is to uh, simply increase um, contingencies in our expenditure budget uh, with more money from the um, unassigned. Um, that would be another strategy that we could use um, and then kind of the final, you know, is just to, uh, when more is known, to work on reducing expenditures. And it doesn't have to be one of those. It could be a combination of, of those strategies. I think, Meredith, you where's know, the from, unassigned? Sorry. Where, where is the unassigned on this, you said? So uh, are you looking at this page okay. that has the blue and the yellow? Yes, I think so. It's so, RSU, so down at the bottom of that page? It says unassigned fund balance. Transferring from unassigned, but I don't see a number there. Hmm. Uh, all I see is where it says transferring from unassigned. Uh, oh, undesignated funds to capital. Oh, sorry. Maybe that's no, not. No, you're on the wrong problem. document, you. Uh, okay. Where should I be, Lynn? <laughs> should say budget details for 2120 board meeting budget details. All right. I'll look for that. Never mind. Carry on. Sorry. So one, you know, the strategy that I thought was um, one that I felt helped. I mean, I, I don't know what. Sorry. Go ahead. There's a bad lag. Um, I was just saying the strategy that I felt we, we really needed to consider is to look at that, you know, our monthly uh, expected state subsidy amount that's on the bottom of the same page is 401000 And... I think I would like to be prepared to have that amount either in a reserve or in contingency or in, you know, spare capacity at somewhere either in the budget or in a reserve that we could easily act more easily access next year if there was a curtailment of a month of subsidy. So I think that's my goal for um, how we build in some um, well, a contingency in the event of a curtailment. I was going to use the word cushion and I don't want to use the word cushion. That's not it. It's the, you know, because if we, if we don't do that and we have a curtailment and we don't, haven't built in a way to deal with that, then we'd have to go back out and have a town meeting to pull out over money from unassigned. And it's, you know, a long process if you don't do it up front. Right. I mean, just so people recall, once the tax rate's set, the tax rate's set for the year. That's uh, and likewise, once we set our uh, expenditure level, it would require another town meeting and town vote to uh, change that expenditure level. So I, I agree with Meredith that I think we want to have somewhere, whether it's contingency or undesignated funds, or we can now have. Um, reserve funds for general education. It doesn't just have to be capital improvements or SPED.
400. You could maybe even argue 600. You know, if you take leave, we need to be prudent about having that set aside. It's a pretty different conversation from um, cutting mill rates, right? It doesn't necessarily have to increase the mill rate to achieve that, but um, even if what it's saying is even if you cut expenses, you're keeping the uh, revenue side looking the same so that you actually have that um, emergency fund in the case of curtailments or a uh, lack of local tax collection or whatever it is. So that's, um, and I, I think Meredith enumerated the levers pretty well. We can, um, if we reduce expenses without reducing revenue, that will expand that up. That basically is the same as saying we put it into the contingency lines that are budget um, or we can pull money, you know, we can take a different draw from the unassigned fund than we have in the past. I mean, just to remind everybody, I, I, I think the point is accurate that we're probably going to um, hit the carry forward more than we have in the past. But in recent years, we've more or less had the entire carry forward pop back out of the budget. That's the amount we don't spend in the budget. So it may not be that high this year, but and that's probably premature to talk about it till Lynn gets us a number for next meeting. But uh, that number, it's not like we're really going to lose 800,000 of that. We may lose several hundred thousand of that. Um, so really I think it comes down to cutting expenses and holding revenue constant and putting it into the contingency or um, increasing revenues by doing a bigger draw from the unassigned, which again, one of the appeals of that is that if we don't spend it, it just pops back out next year again. So it, it, um, it, the, the carry forwards a little bit of funny money. The bank account balance is a real money, but the carry forwards a little bit of funny money. So if we say we're taking a higher carry forward and we don't end up needing it, we haven't impacted taxes and we haven't, um, and yet we have the authority to spend that money and the ability to spend that money. But of course, if we draw down our reserve fund too badly, that puts us in a bad place for next year. What do other board members think is the level of uh, prudent extra? Traditionally, our contingencies are we have 200,000 in regular ed, I think, or we have we cut it down to 100,000? 100,000. 100,000 in regular ed, and I think 100,000 in special ed. Special ed is more, less of a, it's, it's um, you know, that actually ends up getting used fairly often just because it's unpredictable what special ed needs. Uh, what kids are going to move into town and things like that. But uh, so really, we used to have a contingency of 200,000. We've cut it down to 100,000, which would cover one week if the state curtailed a month's worth of payments. What do other board members think is the appropriate kind of reserve we need to be thinking about in case of, right, if we don't have, if we don't have these reserves, the other thing is we have to start doing drastic. We can't uh, raise revenue at the last minute. We have to start thinking about doing drastic expense cuts. And you all know how our budget's structured. That's not going to be a, there's there's not fat. That's going to be a very painful exercise to cut the budget in July to make up an entire month of missing revenue. So I do think we need the reserve. Um, what do other board members think is at a prudent level of reserve to be talking about this year? I think for me, I think, I think a minimum is, is that month, right? I mean, I think a month's worth of subsidy payments on top of like keeping our contingencies where we've had them, but then adding somewhere at least a minimum of a month's worth of subsidy. That's kind of the starting point for me. Um, if you want to go six weeks, I could be talking about that. I, I, two months is, is getting up there, but um, I wouldn't say that that's completely unreasonable. But if a month is a minimum. In terms of how we get there, I think I favor a, a combination approach. Um, I do think that we should look at some level of um, reduction in expenditures. Um, as you point out, Brian, I, I don't think there's a, there's any fat there to cut. So anything we're cutting out of that, um, there's going to be a, there's going to be a certain amount of pain involved. But I do think we have to look at that. Um, that being said, I do think that we have the flexibility of, of taking a bigger draw uh, from the unassigned whether that goes in contingency or whether that goes in reserve, given the fact that there are new reserve options, I'd want to know exactly what those new reserve options are uh, before I weighed in on that. But I, I could go on in either of those, but I do think it has to be a combination of a bigger chunk out of, out of the unassigned. Um, and then at least, you know, some, some cuts in expenditures, but what could, what could we cut 
um, without significantly damaging uh, the educational experience that, the, that our kids get and um, and then kind of go from there. What are, are we comfortable with this? Uh, are we not? But I, I'd want some kind of combination. I agree with at least the the one month mark. You're, so, you, Mark, you're talking about one month, which is 401 plus the 200 that we normally have, right? So, yes. at a minimum, six, 601. Yes. Yeah, no, that's where I'm at as well. I agree. I mean, the month, the month we need to have at least a month there. Um, but looking at, I mean, we should always be looking at cuts, but we've already kind of made some this year, but since we have no idea what's going on next year, I don't know if we want to go through and, and look again. If I'm correct, uh, tier two cuts are all future staff with the exception of text. Well, there's only four things in future cuts, right? One of them is textbooks and the other, the other three are all future staff that we don't have now, correct? The uh, library ed tech is current staff. I mean, the other thing that um, complicates this, I mean, Mark, you used the phrase not reducing the educational experience, but we actually, well, not we, but the virus has created a, an educational deficit going into next year, right? So we don't know if we're going to be online instruction or um, in-person instruction in the fall. I mean, I'm sure we all hope it's in-person instruction, but we really don't know at this point in time. So, uh, but either way, you know, they're the, uh, on the special ed level, there's we're legally obligated to have compensation for compensation in terms of time and education for things that were not received this spring. And on online learning, as fantastic as everybody's been doing, students and teachers and parents, I don't think it's realistic that um, students are going to be coming into September with quite the same curriculum covered that they would have otherwise. So we're in this weird position of the budgets are tightening, but actually the educational need next year is going to be bigger than it is this year, leaving aside number of students and everything else. Just, just there's deficits being created right now that are going to have to be addressed next year, unless we want to create a whole generation of, you know, multiple grade years where they're um, not getting the traditional education. So, that's a whole nother factor to, I mean, it's a depressing factor, but it's a whole nother factor to be thinking through in this whole process. So, I mean, just to take an example, curriculum coordinator um, is a new position. We've argued, I think, pretty strongly that nearly every other district that we ever compare ourselves to already has this, even ones that are smaller than us. Um, but is one that I would be especially loath to cut next year because I think dealing with all of the curriculum challenges, right, going back and whether it's high school, they didn't get through the algebra two curriculums, so what is, or the algebra one curriculum, so what's algebra two supposed to cover? There's just going to be enormous curricular challenges. And if we're online, the curricular challenges are even bigger. So um, that's a whole nother factor playing through this whole thing. everybody say at least a month would people prefer a month and a half six weeks i kind of would be talking about six weeks and then if the pain's too bad to get there we can revisit that but i'd rather start aiming for six weeks six hundred thousand on top of the two hundred thousand of normal contingency i'm fine with that i'm fine with going to six i guess i'm, I'm still not clear where that are, are we but we're not talking about increased revenues we're talking about taking it doing it with potential cuts or using uh, unassigned is that is that correct Am that would be my here? intention I, it, we had we when we thought this was all wrapped up uh, a couple weeks ago we were talking about a mill rate of 1.75 which was increased which is less than the 1.95 we had originally promised voters. So my intention would be to keep that at that same point of 1.75 mil increase. So no no change in taxes from what we were talking about several weeks ago. And Leo, I don't, um, I don't, I mean, we could certainly would hope to that's increase That's just a revenue. fact of the, you know, the bond, which. 
Right. I mean, but it, right. We'll so increase revenue we from where? We could hope that tuition would go, uh, that tuition students at the high school would be higher. But I mean, the, the places that we could increase revenue are, are largely out of our control at this point. I mean, Lynn has provided estimates, which, you know, thankfully Lynn, and we love this, is always very conservative. And the chances are we, we maybe come in over that and that increases a line there. But I don't mm -hmm. think we can count on that. Um, and I don't know where else we could go uh, to increase revenue. Um, even marginally, much less dramatically enough to, to deal with the kind of numbers we're talking here. Yeah, and that, that's what I was getting at because I, I think we I, I think we also need to be more, I more so need to be game planning for less revenue, in my opinion, just from the state and from from local. Right, Leo. I so that's, that's what we're talking about is taking money revenue from our unassigned that's sitting there, not in our budget right now, and moving it over as revenue to help our budget but we're not adding expenditures. We're just holding those expenditures in contingency. So basically it's upping our revenue, just taking it from our unassigned because we have nowhere else to pull it from. And that, eight, that eight, 816 is just kind of, that's carry forward that we already had in there, correct? Yeah, that was the same carry forward we had last year. But we're not, we don't, we don't think it's going to be that this year though. We, we're, we know right. that we're pretty sure it's going to be less than that by some not minimal amount, right? Like Lynn will get us that number next week, but it's unlikely to be 800, whatever again. So we'll have to, if we might have, we can take it from there. We can go from in the unassigned, but I, the carry forward, I don't think is going to be, at least if I'm understanding correctly, is not going to be eight something again this year. Well, I think we're talking about two different things there. Um, we can we can still say we're going to put eight sixteen nine oh two whatever it is in our right. revenues for next year. It's just what we um, put back after this year might be less than that. Right, right. In past years, what, what's popped back out has been more or less what we put in, um, and that's not going to be the case this year. It doesn't sound like. Well, but I, I also, I, that's been a goal of ours to gradually have that um, unassigned um, help augment our budget so that it's not growing dramatically each year. And I think we, we've narrowed that down and I think we're right, we're maybe right at the, the best spot for that. Um, last year it increased by 22,000, I think, the total unassigned. Um, each year that's been uh, lower and lower. I think two years ago it it went up by 44,000. So as I said, I think this year there's the potential that it is going to um, be impacted negatively, but that's what we've been working toward actually. Yeah, I mean, okay, just so I'm understanding that then. So last year we put in 816 and there was, an, an, uh, there was only 22,000 more than that and that ends up going into unassigned, is that correct or no? No, last yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> um, last year, the 816 is what's in our current budget right now, and also what we have plugged into FY21 budget. The prior year ending in FY19 is where we added 20,000. We didn't have to take any of that carry forward out. If I recall, last year, the budget was 745,000 of carry forward, which is really taking out of designated funds but we had 767,000 of unexpended funds left at the end of the year. So the net effect was that the undesignated fund went up. We took out 745 and then we put back 767. Yeah, so the 22,000 that I'm referencing is what gave us the $2,112,248,000 total in our unassigned at the end of last fiscal year. So when the audit, at the, when the audit was reconciled, that's what they told us, you know, the exact number was. So that's what I'm referring to as we increased by 22,000, that total $2,112,000 unassigned fund balance. Yeah, I mean, Leo, the larger context is several years back, three years or so back, our carry forward was 600,000. And then we would come out of the budget year with 800,000 left over. So we were adding like six figures to the unassigned balance. 
So the net effect of that is we were basically taxing people to increase the bank account, which nobody wanted. So we've been trying to push that number up. Um, you know, we don't want to go too far in the other direction where we're drawing down our, our reserves because you got to have reserves to function as a business. Um, but we've been trying to calibrate that number and we're, we're, we're about at the point where the amount we take out is the amount we're going to have left over from the year to put back in. So it has a net effect of zero on the, the des undesignated fund. And I, I think what we're talking about is saying, well, this is kind of an emergency year. So maybe this is a year we would actually like to see the undesignated fund drop by, for example, 200,000. So we'd push our carry forward up to a million, knowing that we were not going to have a million left at the end of the year in the budget. So we would actually drop the undesignated fund by 200,000 uh, in the next year, just as a hypothetical example. But we did, we automatically took 126,000. So even if our expenditures, you know, don't come out the way that we anticipate, we already did hit it for 126,000. Um, and we did that directly so that we knew we had an impact. I think it's going to be really interesting. I'm kind of about doing this year's forecast because I know our tuition is a little bit higher than we had anticipated. We had some tuition kids register late. Um, so our revenue, I, Meredith said what our expenditures are going to look like with this um, remote learning. Um, there are definitely expenditures that we are not expending, but then there are definitely things that we have had to spend that was unanticipated. So, Yeah, it's pretty, pretty big guesswork what we're going to have pop out this year. So I think we just need to wait and let you do that number. But I think what I'm hearing is we would like to at least start with the goal of finding 600,000 that um, we have as a buffer in case state and local revenues start to drop out on us. And the goal would be to find that through some combination of carry forward and cuts to expenses. Everybody on board with that? Anybody have a different? Okay. So anything else we need to talk about on the budget for now, Meredith, or really I think probably we should just wait till we see what the carry forward picture looks like next week. Um, you know, as Jake noted, all of all of the tier cut tier one been made, all of the tier two cuts are still things potentially to make. Um, some of those things could also be covered by the care money. That's the one extra source of revenue that's gonna pop in is the care money um, and some of the, but care money's targeted money. So not everything could be covered by care money. So, but it seems like mostly we should just wait on that conversation. Everybody good with that? Yep, I, I think, um, you know, next week we'll have more information. By the meeting after that, we'll have even more information. So, um, you know, as we work through the month of May, I think, um, more things become known to help us um, make decisions about um, reduction of expenditures versus um, use of the unassigned um, or the combination of those and, and what that looks like. Yep, and just to remind people, we probably have till at least the third week in May at this point. I mean, it depends on when the election gets scheduled for, which at this point is sometime in July. So. We do have until about the third week of May at this point to finalize our budget. All right, so unless somebody else has something, we'll go ahead and move on to the next agenda item, which um, is- Brian, yes. I would like to mention one thing. Did you mention about the um, annual budget meeting? No. Okay. I just wanted to mention that's been one of the big concerns that we, we've had. And so I reached out, um, I mentioned it to Commissioner Macon at the Pinkless meeting last week about um, the main issue for us is that carrying forward the FY20 budget um, does not work for us because of the in, um, because the first bond payment being in the FY21 budget causes us to have an unusual increase. Um, and so she said that they were working on something, but that I should contact, she gave me a contact name. And so the information I got was that 
They are working on a potential um, alternative to the annual budget meeting um, so that districts that really needed to, to have that step in the process prior to a referendum could move forward a new budget if that was needed. Um, and so they said that something would hopefully be coming out later this week um, that would share with us what that alternative might look like. Um, so as soon as I hear about that, I'll certainly pass that along um, because that's, a, that's an important step in our being able to put something out on the July 14th referendum. The other thing that I did talk with Sophie a little bit about when I spoke with her last week is um, the date that they commit taxes is typically mid-August. I think um, as long as we have a referendum by that date, um, then it will be able to um, impact the, the taxation for the coming year. So, um, you know, if we have to have a referendum on, an, on a date other than July 14th, um, that's also a second option. So I just wanted to let you know that um, we're awaiting the information from the state on what alternative, alternatives there might be for an annual budget meeting. And um, if that doesn't work out, another option would be to push out our um, referendum for our budget later um, until we can have an annual budget meeting. But there's that about month window between the state referendum date of July 14th and when taxes are um, set for the year. And we really have to have our budget set by that August 7th, about August 17th, I think was the date Sophie said. So yet another moving part. We have no idea how we're going to get a budget that would cover the bond approved at this point in time, but uh, people are working on it. Uh, so COVID response, I think we dealt with a ton of issues last week, but um, you want to introduce this, Meredith? Yeah, I, I don't have anything new to add there. Um, I think, you know, we've um, rolled out the new grading um, framework. And I think principals have been, you know, working with uh, staff, working with families who had questions um, and um, working out, um, I think last week was the first full week of that um, using the um, new framework since its passage. Um, and, you know, I think that, um, I don't know if principals have anything to add to that, but that um, it seems to be um, going okay. Um, I do think that, um, you know, we're finding our way with um, how the, the schedule at the middle and high school works with the Monday through Thursday and Friday, but um, I had a teacher tell me that Friday's actually their busiest day now because they have a lot of check-ins and you know meets with individual students that that are um, happening on that day the way we've set it up so it looks like it's being well used um, at least by the one one teacher's report um, I think it um, at ASA um, we had um, some information sent home around technology use that I think elicited some questions from families one of the things um, in response to that, um, the staff is working on integrating more um, class meets. I asked staff um, last week, Darren had a meeting where we were talking about um, this, the issue of synchronous versus asynchronous. And, and what I asked the staff to do is take a step toward um, synchronous from wherever they are now to move um, one more step um, in that direction. And the student support team has also came up with a great idea for virtual recess to try to give um, students an opportunity to interact with the school community um, uh, for just helping that social emotional um, connection that, that we're all missing right now. So um, I haven't heard reports on that. I see a couple of people on the call that are involved with that. But, um, you know, I think the the staff as a whole are reacting and changing and learning as we go. And, um, you know, I don't have a lot of updates around that. I do, I would say, um, kind of stepping outside of the logistics of remote learning and um, the schedule and the grades, um, 
the Penquis Superintendents Group has been discussing, um, you know, how we finish the year. And since our last meeting, I think our last meeting, we finished the call, I opened my email, and then that night was when the commissioner came out with the, the notice that um, they were recommending that school not return, that we continue remote school for the rest of the school year. So we haven't met as a group since then. Um, but the Penquist group is just discussing, you know, if we want to um, coordinate how the year finishes. And I don't have a lot of updates on that. We've agreed that we're going to continue the conversation. But, um, you know, as Brian articulately pointed out, what, however next year starts is going to be a significant um, change from what is typical. Um, and we're going to have to figure out a way to give staff time to work on being ready for that. So we've just been talking about how that might happen and, um, and, and what the right amount of time with remote learning for the remainder of the year looks like. And so we're continuing that conversation and I will keep um, the board and, and uh, school community updated as we know more. But, um, you know, I think that the longer that we continue in remote learning, June comes. June is always the month that we have uh, a lot of exams and assessment and special school activities. And um, it's going to get, I think, challenging um, to keep students engaged during that last week or so that we would have typically been in person. So I think that's what, um, those are all the factors we're just thinking through about what the right um, end date would be. Right now on the calendar, our end date would be June 12th. Um, so I think, you know, we'll come back as we have more information on that front. Have any questions from board members? Our um, principals building any. principles, our building principles uh, intimately involved, I assume, with that conversation as well. Or, or is that something that's done at the regional superintendent level? Yeah, we've had discussions about it on our leadership team. Um, and, and then, you know, I'm taking that perspective as, a, you know, one voice to bring to the Penquist group. Um, but whatever the Penquist group decides, ultimately, if there's any change to the school calendar, it comes back to the school board for a final decision on that. Um, but yes, the school, we've talked as a leadership team to answer your first question. It, is it, a, and sorry, I'm, you know, first meeting and all, I've already talked too much for the first meeting, sorry. But um, is it about whether there's finals and that sort of stuff, or is that all a foregone conclusion, just to, so I'm up to speed here? Yeah, I mean, we've, um, it's not just about whether there's finals or not. Um, but that's one factor. Um, what we know about the last week or so of school is that at the high school, there's, there's a finals week that we don't, anticip we don't anticipate having that same kind of finals format in remote learning. It's going to look different as all assessment that we're doing looks different right now. Um, in addition to that, it is a is a week where we usually have lots of special celebrations and activities and events and it's not always um, the same kind of instructional pace that we have for the other you know 35 weeks of the school year or so so that's part of our thinking the other part of our thinking is trying to figure out um, a way to have time to prepare for next school year um, and so those are the factors we've been thinking about not to mention the 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 fact of you know, leading up to April vacation, we had five weeks of remote learning. I think everyone needed this week to just recenter, renew, get ready for, you know, this final push. Um, and, um, you know, taking us to June 12th is more like seven weeks from now. And, and that, that feels like a lot um, under the circumstances everyone is under. And it feels like a lot um, compared to maybe what I think that um, we'll, we'll have, find success keeping students engaged with. 
has this has the state and again sorry i don't know that know this stuff already but has the state um uh, the daily requirement thing is that kind of ours to write at this point it is it is oh, okay i didn't i didn't realize that yep all right uh, cool. you may have seen in the news uh, i think it's the rockland school district has come out and said they're finishing school um sometime end of may maybe um, oh, it's may 29th yeah so there, the commissioner has um, granted, uh, said that waivers will be granted for um, the required number of school days. And that's wide open or no? It's a community decision is what it is. I said. Okay, interesting. Thanks. Any other questions or any updates from the principals too? I, I would just well, sorry. Add, say, go ahead. Go ahead, Reg. Okay, sorry. No, I would just say, um, yeah, I, th I think the last, I know it's been a lot of heavy lifting the last five weeks. These last two weeks in particular, I won't single any out, but and heading into April vacation, um, April vacation was just in time, I would say. I think the, um, the last couple of weeks were kind of getting teachers' heads wrapped around just kind of a new grading framework and um, kind of what with the Monday through Thursday synchronous learning Friday asynchronous what that looks like what the expectations are so I um, think the break is going to help and then we'll come back and but but I've been just overall just excited about what what we've done so but also just question how long we can keep it going in a meaningful way I would add, Reg, I concur, absolutely. Um, I would say that I see a real element of adaptability um, in our students, in our community. Uh, there's almost a need for that connectivity. Um, I spent some time today on a virtual recess. I did yesterday as well. Uh, special thanks to our um, student support team and Lisa Earhart, uh, most notably, who set that up just to uh, spend some time with the students and to hear what they're articulating, that they, they want to connect. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard these students miss school. They miss coming to school. So it's been very nice to do that. Um, so yeah, we're moving along. April it came just in time, this vacation. I just, I just wanted to add that <clears throat> I think now that we've been doing this for what five weeks now or so, uh, we have a real good sense of, uh, of what students are being uh, supported, like outside of the normal realm of, of remote school. Uh, uh, like some, uh, there's a small number of students, for example, receiving uh, like home delivery of uh, educational materials, and and uh, another group of students that are working with special education and. and coordination between regular and special education to uh, keep those students uh, engaged. And, and uh, so we, I, I can say that uh, it's, it's variable about how students are engaged. You know, uh, some are engaged daily, uh, multiple times to a high level, and, and uh, others not as much, but all students are engaged at some level. So I, I, can, I can say that. Uh, the grading system was, uh, you know, we rolled that out as, as Reg noted, and uh, overall it was well received. I had uh, oh five or six uh, parents contact me with questions that I was able to clarify. I sent out a video with some clarifying information. Uh, I think it was Thursday, just uh, last Thursday. So, so that so that seemed to help. But uh, overall, that was well received. Uh, one one concern I have is is as the further we get into this uh, is student engagement. Like, like I, I, is there going to be a dip in student engagement? And, and uh, you know, I don't know the question of that, but that's something we want to monitor closely and I think will help us uh, make a decision on, on uh, you know, uh, th that I can bring to Meredith with information about that maybe that she can bring to the Penguist group about is there a dip or is there not? You know, maybe, maybe there won't be. So that's something we'll have to watch closely moving forward. Thank you. Any other questions? 
I think we're ready then to move to the next item, which is public comment, our second public comment period. Is there any public comment? Don't see anybody unmuting. So our next meeting is the regularly scheduled board meeting a week from today, Tuesday, April 28th, um, 6 p.m. Uh, it says town council chamber, but it will be by Zoom, I'm certain. So uh, when the agenda goes out, it will have Zoom links on it. And is there any requests by board members for information or follow up? I made a note that Mark said he wanted information on the new allowances around reserve accounts. Would you like me to bring that, put that in the next board meeting? That would be helpful. That'd yeah. be great, thank you. Any other I did also, at the last meeting ask for uh, kind of some, an update on how those Fridays were being used at the middle school and the high school. And I, I don't expect that to be ready tonight because this was a special meeting obviously, but um, hopefully we can have that um, at the meeting on Tuesday next week. Yeah, so principals can include that in their principal reports for next week. Not seeing anything else, we'll go ahead and move on. So all that remains are executive sessions. There won't be any other motions except for a motion for adjournment. So while we're taking the votes to move into executive session, people who aren't part of the uh, board or administration, uh, I think that's right, yep. We want the administration at the next one. So uh, you can go ahead and drop off. So I would make a motion to go into executive session under one MRSA 4056F, discussion of confidential records, emergency response plan. Is there a second? I second. And Leo, you weren't here, but by law for Zoom meetings, we have to do a roll call vote. So Aaron, your vote? Aye. Uh, Jake, your vote? Aye. Leo, your vote for aye. executive session. Mark? Aye. I also vote aye. So we will go ahead and go into executive session. We've got a couple people still to drop off.